disgusted and repulsed don't even begin to describe what I felt toward my ex-roommate. She was really something else. Moving into the dorms your freshman year of college is supposed to be one of those fun experiences in life, something you look forward to all summer. Well, I look forward to it at least. Move-in day went well. I was a little disappointed when they told me that I wouldn't be having a roommate. I always envisioned my roommate becoming my best friend and doing everything together, but I guess that wasn't meant to be. The first half of the school year went great. I made plenty of friends and had gotten really used to having the room all to myself. When they told me I'd be getting a roommate in January, I was actually pretty bummed. I cleaned up the other half of the room to accommodate the girl that would be moving in and just hoped that we would get along. She came the second week of January when we had gotten back from winter break. She told me her name was Cassandra, but they should just call her Cassie. And Cassie didn't have much. She said it was because her parents never bought her anything and whatever she had, she had bought herself. I think she had maybe four boxes in total. I felt bad for her and told her that she could borrow some of my stuff if she ever needed to, but to ask first so I wouldn't think that I just lost it or something. And I quickly realized Cassie wasn't the average 18-year-old girl. She was different. First, she had horrible hygiene. I had to beg her a few times to take a shower in the nicest way possible because she would smell so bad that I actually would gag when I entered the room. She always thought it was kind of funny. She never washed her clothes, which also meant that the clothes that she would borrow of mine never got washed either. She would give me back my shirts with sweat stains and food covering the front. It was like this girl had never been taught any manners or basic social skills ever in her life. But the worst thing about Cassie was her obsession with eating raw meat. And I'm not kidding you. I walked in on her eating cuts of raw bacon one day, and she tried hiding it when I walked in, but there was no way that I could unsee that. I asked her why she was eating raw bacon, not to shame her or anything, but I just was genuinely morbidly curious, really grossed out obviously, but still curious. She said it was something that she'd always done growing up and that her parents ate raw meat too and that it was just a normal thing for her. I honestly thought it was completely disgusting, but I also was trying to be a good roommate and as nice as I could, so I told her as long as I didn't have to witness her eating it in front of me, I was cool with her keeping her raw meat in the mini fridge. I should never have said that. The next day I opened the mini fridge to find it full of pounds of pounds of meat. All different kinds too. Bacon, ground beef, different cuts of steak, and even some goat meat. When Cassie walked in and saw me staring into the fridge, she looked at me. She was smiling ear to ear, so proud of her meat stash. She bragged about the deals that she found, and before I could stop her, she reached in front of me, grabbed a package of ground beef, opened it up, and started shoving it into her mouth. I almost threw up right then. I was yelling at her to stop, and with meat still in her mouth, she just laughed. I reacted in horror when I felt bits of it land near me, and that only made her laugh harder. The next day I requested a room change. I couldn't take it, but I was told that that would only be possible in the next two weeks. I was fine with that as long as it meant that I could escape the nightmare that was this disgusting person known as Cassie. She really freaked me out. I told her she wasn't allowed to borrow my stuff anymore since she never returned anything in a good enough state for me to use anyways. She was upset, but seemed to understand. We didn't talk much the week after I requested a room change. She continued to stash all her meat in the fridge, but at least she wasn't eating it in front of me anymore. A couple of days before I was due to move out of the room, I was sitting at my desk next to Cassie when she walked out of the room. I got a call from one of my friends and leaned back as we talked. I was looking around the room when my eyes settled on her computer. One of the tabs had three words that read, Wanted fresh meat. I laughed and told my friend what I saw. He told me to click on it and see what it was because he was curious, and I never in my wildest dreams would have expected to see what was on there. When I clicked on the tab, my laughing quickly halted. My friend was asking me over and over what it was, but I was too scared to even speak. It was an ad that she had posted on a website I had never even heard of, and the fresh meat that she was looking for wasn't from a cow or a pig or a goat. She had posted a wanted ad for fresh human meat. In the ad, she carefully explained how she liked eating raw meat and had always dreamed about what human meat would taste like. She seemed to be obsessed with it. 
One line completely caught me off guard and made me want to join the witness protection program immediately, and in it she said, Eating human flesh has consumed my every thought. Sometimes I watch my roommate sleeping and fantasize about chewing on her. I took a picture of the ad on my phone and clicked off of it so she wouldn't notice I was on her computer. I grabbed my bag and headed out, telling my friend to meet me at the police station immediately. I told them everything and showed them the picture of the ad. In conjunction with the university and their concern, they spoke to Cassie about this, and surprisingly, she admitted to everything. They took it as far as actually testing all the meat in the fridge since we lived on campus, but thankfully, it was all either beef or pork. I was able to get a restraining order against her and she was expelled from the university for apparently accessing the dark web while using the school's Wi-Fi and for attempting to engage in illegal activities. Now for a while, people actually compared Cassie to that German guy, Armin Maiwis, who cannibalized a person who volunteered to be eaten. Who knows if she really would have gone through with it though. I don't think Cassie was ever charged for what she did. I tried to distance myself from her as much as possible. Hearing her name five years later would still be too soon. After her arrest, I just never saw her again. I think she must have just moved away out of embarrassment for what she did, but she was expelled from the school, and the entire town knew who she was and what she did. There would have been no escaping the whispers and dirty looks and I do hope that she got the help she clearly needed. I still don't know how anyone could survive eating raw meat like the way she did. I ended up getting a new roommate after that who was perfectly normal, maybe even a little boring in some ways, but that was totally okay with me. I'll take boring over a cannibal any day. What I'm about to tell you happened a little over a year ago, so it's still all pretty fresh in my mind. I was 18 and a girl in my class named Kendra was having a really hard time at home. Her parents fought all the time and she always talked about how much she wished she could just disappear. She confided in my mom, who was a teacher at the high school we went to, and my mom offered to let her stay with us. Only we didn't have an extra bedroom so that meant that she'd be staying with me as a roommate. I was really upset. My mom moved most of my furniture out to make room for another bed. Kendra was 18 too, which meant that she didn't have to get permission from her parents to leave, so she moved in pretty quickly. I noticed right away that something was off with her. She would spend hours sitting in front of the mirror, just smiling at herself. I would ask her what she was doing, and she always responded that she was practicing. Only, she wouldn't say for what. Most nights, I'd hear her in the bathroom talking to herself seriously having full-on conversations, and it really freaked me out. But when I told my mom, she just said Kendra was awkward and having a tough time and for me to be nice. Kendra and I never became close. She made it very clear that she didn't like me. She ignored me constantly and would express anger whenever I'd hang out with my mom without her. Her jealousy turned into something really weird the day she dyed her hair to look like mine. She even went to the same hairdresser I go to and gave her a picture of me to go off of. She was open about it too. I continued to complain to my mom about her, now copying the way that I look, but again she told me to just be nice and put up with it because Kendra was having a very hard life. Weeks went by and the copying got worse. She would repeat everything I said, but in different voices, almost like she was trying to mimic the way I sounded. She started using my clothes too, and no matter how much I told my mom it creeped me out, she always told me to just go along with it for a while. I started feeling uncomfortable in my own home. I hated being in my room with her. The worst nights were when I would wake up to Kendra standing at the foot of my bed. Sometimes she'd be staring at me. She'd smirk when I expressed a sense of fear. And after a few months of her living with us, I decided to start sleeping in the living room to try to escape the awkwardness of sharing a room with a person I had started to believe was a legitimate sociopath. The living room proved to be not too much better though. She would still watch me sleep from the armchair across from the sofa and laugh when I woke up, scared of what she might do to me in my sleep. My mom never believed me when I told her what she was doing during the night. She told me Kendra always denied it and that I was probably making the whole thing up to try to get her kicked out of the house. I was done at this point. I decided one night that I was going to set up a camera to catch her in the act so I could show my mom and Kendra would be gone for good. That night, 
I set my phone on record and positioned it so it would hopefully be out of sight. I never expected to see what I saw the next morning when I went to check what I'd caught from the night before. I watched as Kendra slowly and quietly made her way down the stairs towards the sofa I was fast asleep on. She stood at the end of the sofa for a whole 30 minutes before she sat down in the armchair to watch me for another hour. Then she made her way into the kitchen. With wide eyes, I watched as she came back into the room with a large knife. She walked towards me and bent down to whisper something in my ear, and she laughed and held up the knife above her head like she was going to stab me with it. Then she brought it down quickly, but stopped just away from my face. I screamed when I saw her head turn to look directly into the camera. I wanted to cry when I heard her say, You actually thought I didn't know what that was there? I know everything that happens in this house. Remember that. She then walked toward the phone and turned the video off. I immediately rushed upstairs to tell my mom, but instead was struck in the chest with a wooden baseball bat. It was Kendra. I screamed at her and asked her what she was doing while trying to catch my breath, but she looked at me with no emotion on her face at all. She started to drag me into my room, and as I was in that daze from getting struck, she began to tie me to the desk chair. She told me I didn't deserve the life I had. I shouldn't have been given a loving family when she was given an awful one. The goosebumps that went through my body confirmed what I was thinking when she said, You don't appreciate the life you've been given, so I'm taking it. I started shaking uncontrollably, begging her to let me live. She laughed and told me that she wasn't going to kill me. She was just going to live as me for a while. I didn't really know how that was possible, but I decided... It was best not to antagonize the crazy person right in front of me. And I was already pretty sure that she'd broken a few of my ribs with a bat and I didn't want her to pick it up again and continue where she left off. She dragged me, still tied to the chair, and put me in the closet and closed the door. I could still see her through the cracks and cringed when she put on more of my clothes and styled her hair to match mine. Finally, I could hear the sound of the door opening and my mother coming home from work. She called out my name and... I started screaming for her to help me. Kendra opened the closet door and told me to be quiet or she'd hurt my mom, so I shut my mouth. I watched as my mom burst into the room and asked her where I was since she'd heard me calling for help. I started to feel sick when Kendra said, But mommy, it is me. My mom looked at her with pure confusion and asked her what she meant, and Kendra kept repeating herself, It's me. Don't you recognize your daughter? I saw my mom's face drain of color when she asked Kendra what she'd done to me, and that's when Kendra had enough. She shoved my mother to the ground and screamed in her face that she was her daughter and she needed to act like it. My mom got up slowly and as nicely as she could, she says, Oh, oh my goodness, I, I don't know what's got into me today. Of course you're my daughter. Let's make, a, let's make some tea. Just stay right there. She left the room and... Kendra opened the closet door to tell me her plan was working and that my mom believed her. I, of course, knew that clearly wasn't the case and that Kendra had lost her mind. I was 100% positive my mother was downstairs calling the police, but I wasn't going to tell Kendra that, though. My mom came back upstairs 15 minutes later and told Kendra that T was downstairs and please join her. Kendra and my mom left the room and within seconds, I heard the police entering and her being arrested. My mom found me in the closet soon after and untied me. She immediately apologized for never believing me and in that moment, I was just happy to be in my mother's arms. Kendra was charged with assault with a deadly weapon at first but was deemed unfit to stand trial. Instead, she was sent to a mental facility where they'd assess her condition further to decide whether or not she should be a danger to herself or others. She was sentenced to spend at least three years in that facility before she'd have the chance to get out. All in all, the experience was truly a nightmare, but I also couldn't help but feeling at least a little sorry for Kendra. She was never given a chance in her life to grow into anything but what she became. She may have been the scariest roommate I truly ever had, but I don't blame her. I blame her horrible parents. If they had just given her the life she deserved, I doubt that wherever her mental health started to deteriorate, it may have never actually gone down that route. A couple months in her stay in that facility, I got a letter from Kendra in the mail. 
In it, she told me that she was on medication and had plenty of time to think about what she did. She apologized and expressed how much she hoped I could forgive her. I actually wrote her back telling her I had already forgiven her and that I hope she continues to get the help that she needs and that there was no hard feelings between us. And even though I have forgiven her, I'd be lying if I said that there wasn't still a part of me that's scared of what she might do when she does eventually get out. My brother is a 16-year-old boy who's thin, weak, and short. On the other hand, I'm an 18-year-old male. I'm athletically built and tall. My parents had recently been hired for new jobs at our local clinic, and they were really struggling with time management. This left me and my brother most of the time home alone, which we understood, and we had no problem with it. However, one night in particular, I was obligated by my school to attend a camp that one of my extracurricular clubs was hosting in a different city not too far away. Ultimately, I decided I really wanted to go, as most of my friends had already confirmed they would be going as well. I decided not to tell my parents about the club. I mean, I'm already 18, and I believed it was unnecessary to ask for permission. Now that I think about it though, not asking for permission is yet to this day my worst decision ever. As night fell and my parents departed to their workplace, I began telling my brother everything he needed to know before I left that afternoon. He seemed hesitant at first, but soon realized I was extremely excited to finally leave our small town and explore something new. He promised everything would be alright and that he wouldn't tell our parents he'd be alone until the next morning. Before leaving, I acknowledged how selfish I was being and the potential harm that my brother could possibly face. I texted one of my friends who had previously told me she was willing to babysit as a side hustle. I explained the situation and immediately she agreed to stay over and watch for my younger sibling. I told my brother about the girl that he'd let in and the reasoning behind her presence. I felt relieved but still felt guilty. My ride showed up and I eventually left before the babysitter even arrived. Later that night, I received various text messages from my brother. However, I decided to ignore them as I was busy unpacking most of my stuff and those messages were probably weird and funny TikToks that he usually sends me. Well, around 12 a.m., I got a phone call from him. I silently picked up the phone, trying to avoid waking up everyone who was already asleep and instantly felt the world turn upside down when I heard loud crying and breathing. That was all I heard for the first 20 seconds until I finally called out again. Hello? Who is this? Are you okay? Finally, my brother replied. JJ, there's people in the house looking for the girl. She's hiding somewhere and they know I'm here. I'm scared. I initially thought it could be a prank as it sounded so weird and almost pulled out of a horror movie. Nevertheless, the crying and breathing said otherwise. I told my brother to stay hidden and to call the cops. As I was talking to him though, I had heard a gunshot in the background, followed by a sound of screaming and yelling. At this point, my brother had begged me to return and to call my parents. So I did, and I then explained as fast as I could. They immediately questioned me, but I told them there wasn't much time left and they had to go back home. Meanwhile, I was trying to get one of the teachers to drive me back home. Luckily, he agreed after hearing my very detailed story amidst my panic attack. Once I arrived home, there were infinite cop cars and many ambulances near the premises of our house. My brother was unharmed but in a shocked state. I apologized profusely and I tried to comfort him while being scolded by my parents. To this day, I'm unaware of the reasoning behind the events that unfolded on my house that particular day. No casualties were found, only several bullet holes around the house. I learned to not ever trust anyone or at least have a background check for the people I let in my house, especially when my little brother is alone. I'll be sure to provide an update if something else comes up. 
I genuinely doubt there will ever be one, as I reside in a small town and the police are sometimes not as helpful as we assume they are. Stay safe, and remember that sometimes not everything goes as planned. The moral of the story is to not be selfish. Well, for me anyways. My name is Thomas. One night, my friend for privacy reasons who we'll call Aaron was home alone for the weekend because his parents had left for a business trip. So he called me over and he asked if I wanted to have a sleepover. I had rode my bike around 7.30, entering from the back gate and from his back door, I had then greeted him and we ordered a pizza and played quite a few video games. We eventually got bored so we watched a movie. Halfway throughout the movie, we decided to ding-dong ditch a few houses. After many laughs, we head back to Aaron's house. After a few minutes, we had heard a banging coming from the front door. We were shocked, but when we opened the door and there was no one there, we had saw a note that then read, I'm coming for you. So we shut the door so fast, locking it from the top lock and the bottom one. Now, Aaron lives in a two-story house, so keep that in mind. Neither one of us knew what to do, but we calmed down after we stated it could be a prank on us from the people in our school because there was actually a prank war going on. So about another half hour into the movie, we both froze due to the sound of the front door then turning, when both of us just started thinking again about the creepy note we had gotten, when we both raced into his room which is on the second floor. Oh shit, dude, I forgot to lock the door. I said. As I said that, we had heard the back gate begin opening. Aaron was aggressively telling me to go lock it. When I went to the back door, I could then see a silhouette of about a six foot tall man looking inside through the door, but I don't think he saw me in return. Aaron had come down and caught up with me when I then signaled to him to go back to the room. We went into the room and we shut the door but it had no lock due to his strict parents. I told him to call the cops and his parents, but he said no, that he wasn't allowed to have anyone over for the weekend, and he didn't want to get in trouble, so we had no choice but to hide under his bed. We began to then hear what sounded like the house being completely ransacked, things being thrown around and broken, doors slamming, etc. Then it got worse, even more terrifying than it already was. We began to hear footsteps coming up the stairs. Aaron's door then slowly opened. We had heard the closet open and then clothes being moved around. And then he just seemed to stop. The bed we were hiding under had a huge blanket over it that hung all the way down to the ground level. So unless someone moved the blanket, you couldn't see us. 20 minutes later, I'd asked Aaron, Dude, do you think we can run yet and get the f*** out of here? But then, before I could even react, Aaron was then immediately dragged from underneath the bed, to which I then heard the most disturbing, ear-shattering scream which Aaron let out while being dragged from under the bed. It was right then and there that I knew I had to f***ing do something or someone was going to die that night. I got out from under the bed to see Aaron struggling to get loose from the six-foot psycho's death grip. I desperately searched the house to find something to use as a weapon. I found a screwdriver. I ran back upstairs charging towards the man and made absolutely sure I stabbed him and got the screwdriver fully through his back. He then let out a blood-curdling scream, letting go of Aaron. We quickly ran out to Aaron's backyard, which led to the very dark woods. We then hid in some bushes near the entrance of the forest. We saw the man leaving the back gate, now holding a knife, which I guess he took from the kitchen. I felt his eyes pass me when Aaron then whispered, We gotta run! To which I then replied back with, Why the f*** would we run now? We've came this far. Might as well keep going. But dude, he's coming right at us! Aaron said. And he was right. The man was running straight towards us. I still to this day don't know how he saw us in the pitch black like he did. Aaron had lived in the countryside of town, so the neighbors were about one to two miles away, and the road was a straight path so he could easily see us. 
My lungs felt like they were on fire, and I ended up falling because of a tree root sticking out. Aaron stayed with me, trying to pick me up, but the man was right behind us, and he was at least seven feet away from us. I could clearly see him in a tall black hoodie and white sweatpants. I don't know how, but this time luck was finally on our side. It seemed that this time he didn't see us. He then ran off in the other direction, and we sprinted even faster. I was the slower one, but I swear I could hear leaves crunching behind us. We entered the back gate, making sure to lock it. Remember before how Aaron was too scared to call his parents or the cops because of the repercussions of him getting in trouble? Yeah, well, that. I told Aaron to call the damn cops already, that it's gotten too bad. We need the help. And with much hesitation, we finally called them. I stayed on lookout to see if I saw the man coming back. It was so dark out and I couldn't see a thing, but I then did something so regrettably stupid. I shined the flashlight in the woods when I saw it. I saw his dark, tall silhouette. I thought he was going to run directly towards us yet again, but no, he just turned around and ran back into the dark woods. The cops arrived and they searched the property, but they didn't find him. They only found the missing kitchen knife he took. The cops claimed there was going to be an investigation, but with not much to go off besides the knife, I really doubt much was ever done. And if there was, we never got an update on it. My guess is the guy's still out there somewhere, wreaking havoc. But yeah... That's the story of how me and my best friend Aaron almost died while home alone together. Stay safe, everyone, and make sure to lock the doors and windows at all times. It just may end up saving your life someday. This event lasted less than five minutes, but was still one of the scariest moments of my life. My aunt and uncle, who were both major junkies, moved into our house when I was around nine years old. Though I really looked up to my aunt, I was always very uncomfortable around my uncle, who was to put in nicely the epitome of abusive white trash that one may imagine. He was skeleton thin from drugs, had a shaved head, covered in poorly done vulgar and racist tattoos, and to top it off, he had missing and rotting teeth. He was always drunk or high, and definitely wasn't good around kids. Well, one evening, my mother went out with my aunt, so my uncle was there, though he wasn't our usual assigned babysitter. Cass, my twin, and I had been taking care of ourselves and my little brother for years at that point, and we were certainly more mature than my uncle could ever be with all of his missing brain cells. Cass and I were hanging out in the living room while my brother slept upstairs in his room. My uncle suddenly came staggering out of his room, which was directly next to the living room. He squinted his eyes like he didn't recognize us. Now, we weren't afraid at all of our uncle, but we definitely weren't about to listen to him. Our uncle had then tried to kick us out of the living room, but we didn't have a TV in our room, so I'm sure that I said something that made him angry. More than likely telling him we didn't have to listen to him and that he had his own TV in his room. He marched back into his room, and I thought that was that. But then... He came back in holding a pillow from his bed. Before I could even begin to comprehend his intentions, he had stomped across the room and then pinned me to the couch, fully holding the pillow over my head. Even writing this, I can feel my heart pounding and I'm having trouble completely catching my breath. I couldn't breathe and I just remember throwing my hands about frantically trying to pull his hands off. I had bit my nails as a kid so I couldn't even dig my nails into him. I was gasping for air and quickly losing consciousness when I then heard my sister screaming. I was about to fully black out when the weight lightened and I was able to throw it off, gasping like a fish out of water. Cass had jumped onto his back and he had flung her off, panting hard with such a cold look in his eyes as he staggered back. My uncle stormed out of the house, cursing at us, and we immediately locked the glass bag door behind him. We sobbed and held each other, sitting in the middle of the living room. 
We fell asleep wrapped in each other's arms, and we only woke up when the front door unlocked and then opened a few hours later. We ran to meet my mother and aunt at the front door, but they were both drunk off their asses and were giggling and shushing each other as they staggered in. I knew that they'd be no real help now, but Cass explained and my mom was actually overly nice when she was drunk. So she then hugged us and began crying, telling us how much she loved us, which was a rarity. She and my aunt stayed up with us, them still drinking, and they turned on a horror movie and gave us each a shot. I know what you're thinking, but even at nine years old, we weren't about to turn that down. When my uncle began banging on the glass bag door at 4 a.m., my aunt staggered over and told him to go f himself and to sleep outside for the night. He didn't come back for three days, but when he did, he acted like nothing had ever happened and he avoided us like the plague. So dear readers, don't trust someone with your kid just because they're family, especially if they're family like mine. You never know what someone is truly capable of, especially in a moment of rage. This probably won't seem very scary to most, but it's one of the scariest moments of my life. If my sister hadn't have intervened, I truly believe he would have possibly killed me. Even more than 10 years later, I still wake up sometimes gasping for air, like it may be my last.